Okay, our, our, our second speaker is Dr. Steve Ma, who is Associate Professor in the School of Public Health. <coughs> and he'll be talking, as you can see, about integrative analysis of cancer center omic data. Many thanks for the introduction. So uh, I'm going to uh, take a different spot and discuss uh, data analysis of cancer. Uh, there's nothing to disclose. And well, this is a cancer center presentation, so I don't think I need to reconvince you the importance of cancer omic studies. And compared with more classic epidemiology studies and also clinical trials in omic studies, what we have is usually we have a small sample size and we actually don't have much control with what we have. Usually we cannot really afford selecting samples, so pretty much we work with whatever we have. And also, if you look at the omic features, it can be a gene, a SNP, a, a methylation, locus, a microRNA. Uh, common features for uh, those measurements, uh, first, you know, we have a high dimensionality. Uh, if we're talking about genes, then 20,000 plus for SNPs, uh, very easily going over a million. And also, for most cancers, we don't have very strong signals, so we have a couple of small to moderate signals at most, and that makes the analysis really, really challenging. Just to be clear, so what kind of analysis paradigm we are talking about? So uh, here we are, let's say we're dealing with genes, and we have a 100 samples. What we're trying to do is we're trying to model the joint or combined effects of all 20,000 genes in one single model. So this kind of data analysis is different from one gene or one SNP at a time analysis. Most studies published even nowadays still conduct those individual gene or individual SNP based analysis. And what we are trying to do here is actually different. And for this kind of analysis, since you are dealing with a large number of units in a single model, you need more advanced statistical or data mining techniques. While we are talking about statistical models, so first of all, we want to estimate, and perhaps more importantly, we want to identify markers. We want to identify those genes, microRNAs, that are related to cancer phenotypes or outcomes. And uh, this talk will be focused on mutate data set analysis. And, um, even if you haven't really done it, I, I assume you have heard or seen this kind of a mutated data set analysis at some point. So the first scenario is really classic, where you pull studies from uh, independent studies with similar or even the same designs. This is just a classic meta-analysis idea. So what we are trying to achieve here is, well, since we have small summer size with cancer omic studies, let's just have more independent studies, and so we can have a larger sum of combined sum of size, so we can have more power. And this idea is by no means new. The second scenario is more recent, and in some sense more interesting. This study is published uh, just a couple weeks ago in Nature, and in this study, uh, researchers look at 12 major cancer types. They analyze the existing TCGA data. So the goal is to really look into uh, what's common across different cancer types and also what's unique. So what makes one cancer type different from another. And if uh, you are interested in mutable cancers, you have to conduct mutated data set analysis. And for mutated data set analysis, a more straightforward or more, more classic approach is to do a meta-analysis. So uh, the strategy is, let's say you have 10 independent data sets from 10 studies. What you do is you first analyze those data sets individually. If you have 10 data sets, you conduct 10 separate analysis. After that, you try to combine some sort of summary statistics. Can be the list of markers you identified, odds ratios, hazard ratios, p-values, like that. And in the more recent integrative analysis, what we and others have proposed is instead of pulling summary, statis summary statistics, we try to pull the raw data. 
So you have to have access to the 10 raw data sets. And instead of doing 10 separate analysis, you do the analysis just once. So it's a different strategy from the meta-analysis. And a very natural question to ask is why do we want to do something different? And why integrative analysis may have some advantage over meta-analysis? Well, uh, our analysis goal is a little bit different from classic study. We're really interested in marker identification. When you think about meta-analysis, for marker identification, you really do 10 separate market identification. Then you sub try to somehow combine the results. For integrative analysis, it's different. You take multiple data sets into consideration simultaneously in just one single step. So when you try to identify which genes, which microarrays are interesting, you simultaneously consider all those data sets you have. And by pulling information in an early stage, you may have kind of a increased information. So uh, what to expect in integrative analysis? And two years ago, we proposed two models or two scenarios. First one is called a homogenetic model. The second is called a hydrogenetic model. And here, uh, I have two hypothetical studies, each with three data sets and 10,000 genes. And in the homogenetic model, what you expect is you expect the model sparsity structures to be identical across data sets. That means if you identify one gene in a study, you have to identify the same gene in other studies. So it's the same gene sets identified in all three data sets. And in hydro and a hydrogenic model, it's different. So for example, for the first gene, it has zero regression coefficient in the second data set, but non-zero regression coefficients in the first one and the third one. So potentially, you can have different model sparsity structures in different data sets. And a couple of statistical notations. And uh, not many people here are statisticians, so I'm not going to bug you with the details. What's really important is actually the last sentence. Uh, in the modeling stage, there is actually nothing new. Uh, we just take whatever classic models we work with before. Uh, if it's a classification problem, it's a logistic regression. If it's survival data, you have Cox model. So whatever you have in the past, you have the same model now. So what's really different from classic analysis is how you do the marker selection. Uh, we have developed a couple of different techniques using like penalization, stretch holding, sparse boosting. Well, statistically, they are different. They have uh, different assumptions. They work in different ways. Uh, I take the penalization as a specific example here. So uh, if you still recall what we, we, we done kind of in classic data analysis, you have a likelihood function or some sort of objective functions to work with. And what's new here is we have an additional term, this penalty term. And all the tricks, all the new in exciting developments are actually on this penalty function. Uh, here I want to actually deliver this message here. So uh, here we actually have a different identification strategy. We no longer use p-value. In most classic statistical analysis, we say a marker or a variable is important if its p-value is less than 0.05. And if you have a large number of markers, you do some sort of mutual comparison adjustment, like Bonferroni or FDR. Here, the strategy is different. The marker identification is based on estimation only. So what we do is we look into the estimate here. If you have a non-zero estimate, we say there is an association between the corresponding marker and cancer phenotype and outcome. So there is no p-value involved. And marker identification is based on the estimates only. So uh, what's new here is a penalty function and, of course, the challenge is to find a proper penalty.
annotate function. So a uh, couple of small things we have done. Uh, the first example is a uh, breast cancer prognosis study. So here we just grab for publicly available uh, breast cancer studies. So the goal is to identify genes associated with breast cancer prognosis. And here we assume a home genetic model, so you expect the same set of genes to be identified across all four data sets. And here is a list of genes we identified. Um, actually, I think most people here know more about cancer or cancer genes than I do, so uh, I'm not going to spend more time discussing what those genes mean. We did some bioinformatic analysis to show those genes are actually sensible. And the second study is actually quite interesting. So here we have four case control studies and on four different type of cancers, kidney, liver, prostate, and stomach cancer. So we just kind of randomly grab those four type of cancers. And the question is, if there's any gene shared by the etiology of those four cancers. And uh, here, in terms of selection of cancer types, there's actually, well, in some sense, there is no guidance. We do allow different data sets to have zero overlap. And so we just kind of randomly select those four cancers. And as you can imagine, you can actually select other cancer types and see if they have anything in common at all. This kind of research uh, looking into the commonality of different cancers or different diseases has attracted a lot of t attention recently. And um, there's uh, actually several groups doing human disease network analysis, trying to connect the dots between different type of diseases. And here, what we do is we just focus on cancer only. And uh, Amazingly, in those cancers, we, well, we selected them, it's actually kind of randomly, but amazingly, they do share one or two genes. So uh, that's really interesting. And another study, uh, another kind of a long study we have done is trying to accommodate what kind of hierarchical structures are out there among the omics measurements we have. Uh, I assume you have heard the pathway analysis even if you haven't done so. So uh, let's say for SNP data, we naturally have this kind of two-level structure. We have multiple SNPs belonging to the same gene, and we have multiple genes belonging to the same pathway. And in a couple of studies, people have looked at in clusters of pathways, what they call super pathways. So uh, you can think of it kind of as a tree structure. You go from the most elementary elements. And here, that will be snakes. You go up one level, you have genes. You go up another level, you have pathways. And you go up again, you have these super pathways. So the goal is to select markers while taking this kind of a hierarchical structure into consideration. For SNAP and SNAP data, two basic facts. First is, if you look at individual SNAPs, quite often they have very weak signals. But combined together, if you look at a gene or pathway level analysis, they may ha actually have detectable effects. So uh, if you look at the effects at a higher hierarchical structure, you may identify something. The second information is not all SNPs in important genes are important. So uh, especially for those large genes, it's possible at the gene level, those genes are important. But if you look close enough, for SNPs in important genes, some SNPs are important, others are not. So when you do selection, it's actually kind of a multi-level selection. You need to identify those important SNPs within important genes. So you have one level selection at the SNP level, another selection at the gene level. And if you have pathway, it's another level of selection. If you have super pathways, that's one more level of selection. So it's kind of a nested selection structure. <coughs> this is a study we uh, actually, uh, this non cultural lymphoma study, we have been involved in this study for a couple of years. It's a joint effort by NCI and also Yale uh, School of Public Health. 
and I have been working on the prognosis. So uh, what we have here is we have prognosis data on individual subtypes, DLBCL, FL, uh, CL, LSLL. I do believe we have a couple of mental cell lymphoma, but the sample size is too small to conduct any meaningful analysis. So uh, here what we are trying to do is we are trying to see if those different subtypes share any common markers. Well, uh, we know those different subtypes are different, like uh, FL is indolent, DLB cell is more, uh, more aggressive, but they are all non-Hodgkin lymphomas, so it's sensible they have something in common. So uh, here what we have is we have SNAP data and we want to take this SNAP within gene and the gene within pathway, this hierarchical structure into consideration into consideration. So uh, what we have done is in a study published last year, we identify those three genes with prognosis of DLBCL and CLL and a couple other genes associated with the prognosis of FL and CLL. And this one gene uh, we identify to be associated with all three subtypes. Uh, this uh, MEFV, uh, Mediterranean fever, it's actually a pretty, pretty interesting gene. Uh, we did some literature research. In a couple studies, this gene has been suggested as associated with DLBCL, FL, and some, I think, one or two other subtypes. But uh, our study is the first one to conduct this kind of integrative analysis and uh, for the first time identify this gene in kind of one single study. A more interesting and in some sense more challenging hierarchical structure is network structure. So uh, we have one gene can regulate another genes but not, not necessarily the other way around. So uh, in the pathway of the, this kind of a gene pathway hierarchical structure, what we have is a kind of a stat static clustering structure uh, which contains some information but not rich enough. And this network based analysis can have more information. So what we have here, uh, I don't assume you can read anything on, on this plot, but what we have here is for any two genes, any two SNPs, any two microRNAs, we have one line connecting them. And uh, this line measures how strongly those two measurements are connected to each other. And in our study, as a first step, we only do undirected network, so the connection between gene A and B and B and A are actually equal. This is kind of a, well, it's one step further than pathway analysis, but uh, still not accurate enough. So ideally, you, you should have a directed network, so one gene can regulate the other, but not necessarily the other way around. And in this study, we collected three lung cancer prognosis data sets from Michigan, Moffitt, and Dana Farber. And here is a list of genes we identify. Uh, all those three studies are gene microarray gene expression studies, and all on, pro, uh, on lung cancer survival. So uh, here is a list of genes we identified and their estimates. Well, uh, for all those studies I have mentioned, we did statistical validation, we did bioinformatic analysis, but uh, what's missing is more kind of a more functional study. So uh, quick remarks. Uh, in in analysis of cancer omic data, mutated data set analysis has advantages over single data set analysis. Uh, if you have studies with similar designs, you can have a larger sample size by doing mutated data set analysis, so you can have more power. And with different data sets on different cancer types, you can look into what's common and what's different among different cancer types. We and others have conducted a series of integrative analysis, and we have evidences, uh, both empirical and, and theoretical evidences showing integrative analysis can be more informative than the classic meta-analysis idea. Integrative analysis does have some limitations. The first, perhaps, uh, 
most important limitation is you need to have access to the raw data. For meta-analysis, especially the simple ones, you only need to look into like uh, published papers that's good enough. But for our analysis, we need to have raw data of all data sets, all studies we want to analyze. And also, uh, the type of statistical techniques needed for integrative analysis are much, much more complicated than integrative analysis. So you need professional statisticians. And uh, right now, we and others, we have been developing user-friendly software, but uh, so far it is still not friendly enough. So uh, that's another limitation of integrative analysis. And uh, last but not least, uh, acknowledge my colleagues have been working with uh, collaborating with us on integrative analysis and also funding support from Yale, from uh, National Library of Medicine, NCI, and many thanks to all of you. Thanks. Here we go. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, the first question, were the SNPs you were referring to constitutional or semantic mutations? Um, uh, well, statistically, we can actually do do both, and uh, for this type of analysis, there's actually not many limitations on what kind of measurements we can analyze. Can be SNPs, rare variants, <coughs> microRNA, methylation, can be actually pretty much anything. So, uh, while well, you do need some minor modifications, but the basic statistical framework will be the same. Okay, thank you. Um, is this integrative analysis different than a pooled analysis, or how is it different? Uh, well, uh, if you look, only look at kind of the big picture, I mean, there's actually pretty similar. We have raw data from multiple data sets, and we try to pull them together. Uh, different is how you do the analysis, so the, uh, what kind of statistical techniques you have, what kind of model assumptions you have. Uh, if you look into the slides of the home genetic model, heterogeneity model, the model assumptions are actually different from kind of a classic pooled analysis. So uh, in short, I mean, if you look at the big picture, quite similar, but if you look at the details, uh, it will be different enough. At first glance, it seems a little intuitive that this integrative analysis would prejudice towards genes that are maybe low-level drivers or very common survival or growth genes. But does it prejudice against finding tissue-specific genes that may be constitutively inactivated in some t tissues and not in others? So are you look? I mean, do you select? Do you prejudice to one type versus another? Uh, well, it really depends. So it depend, actually depends on analysis goal. We can play with a penalty function. So uh, in, with, with one penalty, we can encourage identification of those common markers. And if you assume a different penalty, you can actually uh, encourage identification of what's unique for a specific cancer type. But we, so far, we cannot achieve both in one analysis. So it really depends on whether you're more interested in the commonality or the type-specific markers. But so far, not both in one analysis. So uh, one of the c common issues that comes up and uh, occurs when you have several different kinds of measurements that all feed into the same process. So it, an easy example is you can activate receptor kinases by mutation by overexpression, by gene amplification leading to overexpression, by expression of the agonists that activate them. So what do you see as the uh, pathway to developing uh, tools that can combine these structurally very different data sets? Uh, I would say uh, that will be maybe on uh, one or two steps or even 10 steps from what we have now. So. Uh, Ideally, we want to incorporate that kind of structures, that kind of information. Uh, problem is still uh, we, we are dealing with really high dimensional data, and even for this kind of simple, well, seemingly simple analysis, computationally, statistically, it's already complicated enough. So, uh, for example, in network analysis, so far we can only deal with undirected network. So, if you want to incorporate more information, more structures, I 
I hope it will be doable very soon, but so far we still don't know how to do that. So uh, that will be tomorrow. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, I'd like to thank both of our speakers once again and also put in a plug for YCAS Biostatistics, which is one of the ways you can develop collaborations and interactions with the statisticians and uh, cancer center faculty who are engaged in these sophisticated analyses. Thank you both.